All right, everybody, thanks for being here. Our next speaker up, Caitlin Bowden, and she will be talking about fighting non-consensual pornography the badass way. Take it away, Caitlin. Hello. Um, so this is my first time talking at DEF CON or you know, speaking to anyone here at, at uh, Crypto Village, so thank you guys for having me. This is awesome. <laughs> So I'm Caitlin. I am the CEO and founder of Badass, which a lot of people don't know is, um, it actually means battling against demeaning and abusive selfie sharing. It's not just, you know, a word to use to describe us, but it, you know, has a little bit of a purpose, plus it's a little bit more news friendly, you know, so we do that. I just want to give everyone a heads up before I start. We're going to be talking about some things that, um, you know, it couldn't be triggering for some people. Some people could have experienced trauma similar to what I'm going to be talking about. And just want to give you the heads up that if you need to step out and take a minute, it's totally cool. Um, but if you want to stick around and learn, that's cool too. All right. So let's get started on how badass began. Um, now, a couple years ago, um, I was sitting in my mom's basement and I get a message from a friend that says, hey, you got these pictures online. I don't think you meant to have them online. Um, here's a link. And I go and, you know, it led me to this website called Anon IB. I see, you know, the header where it, they call us sluts by state. I click and there's my high school, which is a tiny high school in Northeast Ohio. And there are people trading graduates from my high school. Like we're nothing, like it's Pokemon cards. And I started realizing this is a thing. This is something that has happened to a lot more people and no one is talking about it. I had no idea this was a thing that existed. There is a whole subculture of people that get off on just trading nudes. And you know, I just got really mad. And I started contacting other victims. I would find them through social media using OSINT, um, different search methods, I'd reach out. And I'm like, hey, you know, I think if we maybe get together, we could actually do something about this. So it, we did. It's been two years. And, um, you know, in those two years, we have done more than I ever thought possible. Um, we've, you know, helped shut down that website and on IB. We, uh, you know, worked with the police to get, make that happen, raise a lot of noise about it. We've um, helped get over, gosh, what are we up to? 20,000 photos down. Um, four victims, uh, we've gotten quite a few arrests, we've empowered, you know, almost 3,000 at this point victims, we've helped them learn how to take their pictures down. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things we want to do is we want to prevent it as well. So we, you know, go around to schools, we talk to kids, we talk to them about what consent means, what agency means, how to be, you know, safe online. We teach them about, you know, basic cybersecurity. A lot of people don't even understand, hey, don't use the same password for everything. I mean, basic things that we, in, you know, we know these things, but a lot of people don't. And that's something that, you know, we should change. All right, so how do we fight non-consensual pornography. Um, if you know, notice I throw a little um, Easter egg up there with the leet, but we uh, fight it four ways. Legislation, education, the empowerment of victims, and then tech. And tech covers a lot, but you know, I just really wanted to use leet, so it worked. All right, the first one, legislation. So. Within a few months of starting Badass, um, you know, we decided we're going to start calling senators. There were only a few of us. We were going to start calling senators, um, any elected official that would listen to us, and let's see if we can get a law in place. And it started working. I don't know how. I don't know how anyone was letting me do this at this point, but I worked with um, Senator Joe Schiavone to bring a law to the state of Ohio. Um, it's now in place. It criminalizes revenge porn, also known as NCP. Um, 
but it, you know, we've also helped with uh, the badasses out in Montana, recently got a law, and just recently I was down in Washington, D.C., introducing a federal law that would make it illegal across the United States. So, here's a brief overview of the Ohio law. Now, I know, I don't know if we have any lawyers in the room at all, but there is a big problem with these laws. It, um, and that big problem is, is that there's an intent to harm clause. Basically, you have to prove that somebody means to harm someone else with the image, which is really hard to do. Proving somebody's intent behind their actions is incredibly difficult. Luckily, the federal law that we've introduced does not have that intent clause. So it's actually gonna be really great for victims to be able to get some justice without having to deal with that whole intent thing. But hey, since you're all in this room, here's your intent, guys. You, re you read it, you know now. If you share these pictures, you're gonna harm someone. So don't do it. All right, so we're gonna start with education. And we'll start off with the thing we, we hear most often. This would never be a problem if you just didn't take news. Now, that is the most victim-blaming, annoying statement, but we hear it every day. Um, the issue isn't about taking nudes. One, there are about 13 different ways that somebody's nudes can end up online. Most of them have nothing to do with them taking the picture. We also deal with hidden cams. We deal with upskirting. We deal with deep fakes, deep nudes, photoshopped images, um, or somebody else taking the photo. I mean, these are very common things. There's not one way that image abuse can happen to a person. And they're all connected. These are all very serious crimes. They cause um, trauma to the victims that I think a lot of people overlook when they think about these sorts of things. Um, another thing that we've been doing with the education is going around to colleges. And um, we started going to Take Back the Net, where it's women online, um, you know, working to stop trauma, the sexual exploitation of people online, and you know, how to prevent it. The next thing that we do, the second, or the first E, or yeah, where was I? Second E of leads is empowerment. Now I mentioned, you know, we've helped all these victims get their photos down, um, but we also teach them how to fight back. You know, we, we give them the tools that they would need in order to, uh, you know, make sure this doesn't happen, to make sure that, you know, they know how to collect the evidence, um, and build a case. We've encountered a ton of, you know, responses from police that are not quite what we expected. Turns out they don't really know how to handle this sort of thing. Especially, you know, in small town Ohio or, you know, any city that doesn't have a major, you know, police presence. So we actually teach the victims how to collect their own evidence, how to go through the EXIF data, how to, um, you know, we teach them everything they do. That way, they, when they go into the police station, they're like, hey, I just did your job. Just please do the paperwork and get this guy. Um, and that's really important. And when it happens to you, um, one of the worst feelings is how helpless you feel. But when it happens again, and you know that, hey, I can do something about this, you're not nearly as helpless. It's the most empowering feeling in the world. Mix that with knowing that there are thousands of people out there that have experienced the same thing you have, and suddenly you go from a group of victims to, you know, this fierce-ass gang that is ready to go out and, you know, just destroy an entire subculture that is harming people. And it's been really great. We've made some great friendships, um, and we've gotten to do some fun things. Um, Another way that we empower victims is we give them a voice. We give them a platform. We are actively helping them go to their um, elected officials and help get these laws put in place. Um, and a lot of people don't get the opportunity to do that, but we make sure they do. 
because each of us has a voice, our story counts, and that is something that, you know, needs to happen. These stories need to be told, and the light needs to be shined on something that has sat in the dark for way too long. All right, so the one of the things, as far as tech, that we teach our victims is about OSINT. Um, now, this is something, you know, I didn't even know OSINT was a thing, actually, up until last year. I thought I was just really good at Googling. Um, but yeah, no, we want to teach them the different things that they can use to hunt down their, the person that posted them. A lot of these websites, they make these people register, they have usernames. And if they have usernames, chances are they used it before somewhere. Where can we find it? How can we tie it to that person? And we teach them how to do that, how to build a you know, solid chain of evidence that can be used in a courtroom to prove, hey, this person with this username is actually the one that shared my images. Now the other thing that we did, and I don't know if you guys have heard about this. Um, we, uh, with tech, we had a uh, friend of ours develop a sh something that could bypass the, uh, um, the flood detection on that website I'd mentioned earlier, Anon IB. Uh, it could bypass the flood detection and it could empower the victims to just go through and fill the entire image board up with pictures of Shrek. <laughs> I mean, it's not hurting anyone. It's nobody, you know, nobody's getting exploited. He's not complaining. So we figured it wasn't going to be a big deal, you know, and we ended up getting, knocking so many images off of that board that as soon as somebody would post a nude, it would just be dropped off. It would be gone. Because it just, we were able to start so many threads of Shrek. I mean, I, we thought it was creative. Kill a few boners and get some pictures down. So that's what we were doing as far as the tech. We also have some other things in the works. Um, ways that we can notify victims. Um, different methods that we can use to track pictures and where they go. Um, and we also really, you know, one of our big things is educating victims and educating the public about ways they can stay safe with this. You know, and whether it is talking to a sex worker about you know, how they can possibly watermark their nudes to make sure that they're not being shared or pirated somewhere else, or, you know, teaching people about exit data and making sure that they're not, you know, accidentally sharing way more information than they want to just by sharing a picture with somebody they trust. Um, and that's, that's a big deal. A lot of people aren't learning these things. I feel like it's almost our responsibility to tell everybody how to stay safe online to um, really promote, you know, more, uh, you know, strong passphrases and account security and things like that. So that's the four basic ways that we do things. And we, um, you know, it covers a lot, honestly. <laughs> in two years, I, I was a bartender before I started Badass. So it's not like I have some advanced college degree. It's not like I have any idea how laws work. I still don't. But we are getting things done. And this is just one little corner of online exploitation. There's a million and a half other things that are going out, you know, going on on the internet that need to be, they need to be dealt with. These need to be addressed. People need to stop being harmed these ways. And you have to hit it from all sides at the same time because if the minute that you move from one to the other, they're moving too. These websites, you know, they switch servers. They are switching their URLs. They're changing everything faster than we can keep up. There's new ones popping up every day. Um, there's new methods being used. We have found these trading circles on Slack, Discord. Um, oh gosh, I can't even think. I'm trying to list them all. There's so many. And the minute that we think we have a handle on one, it moves to the next. And it is very difficult. It really is like playing a game of whack-a-mole a lot of times. But 
I think that we're actually accomplishing something. I don't know, y'all showed up here, so I think, I, I guess people are liking what we're doing. Um, <laughs> so, anyway. Let's talk about how to sex safely, because I'm not gonna tell you you shouldn't do it. You just gotta do it safely. It's your body, it's your agency. If you wanna share that with somebody that you trust, then you should be able to. I think that's important. It's what you want to do. Modesty empowers some, Nudity might empower someone else. It's not my place to judge. I'm just here to make sure that no one is being exploited and harmed. So, first things first, when I said somebody you trust, I really meant someone you trust. Not somebody that, you know, is pressuring you. Obviously, if someone's pressuring you um, and you're not comfortable with it and they're still pressuring you, then they're probably not someone you want to send it to. They just sound like a jerk. So, set your boundaries, stick to them. Um, now, my lawyer always says she is really grateful when somebody does this, and that is, you know, before sharing a picture with your partner, explicitly say through a text message, hey, I don't want anyone else to see this. Grab a screenshot. Your lawyer, whoever you hire, everyone will thank you. They know. You have it in writing. It's, you know, always good to have. Um, Communication is key, talk to the partner before sharing. One of the big things that people run across is um, being out in public. You're hanging out with your friends and suddenly, you know, you're in a relationship and somebody just sends you a picture and they didn't tell you and you open it up and like, oh, you know, it's a little awkward, slightly, but yeah, always ask, get consent. Don't, do, don't be sending, you know, unsolicited pictures. Make sure that that person knows that they're getting it, it's welcome, and um, you know, just get consent, it's important. <laughs> the other thing is, and this is where my, head, my story had gone awry, is making sure that your partner is also able to keep their data secure. If they are not protecting their own pictures, their own information, how do you expect them to protect yours? I mean, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I had, my pictures have been online. I had sent them to an ex-boyfriend, he was having a bad day at work, I'm like, I know how to make that better. And he was somebody that didn't even lock his phone. No passcode, nothing. And we broke up and I figured, you know, he would delete them, I asked him to, he didn't. But somebody actually went and stole his phone to get the pictures. Um, and that is something that is really common. I keep talking about these circles where people like to trade these news and they make a game out of it. What is the craziest way I can acquire these pictures? Whether it's, you know, sneaking into the break room and sending, you know, getting a hold of their coworkers' phones and sending it to themselves. Whether it's figuring out a password, getting into the iCloud or your sage Snapchats whether it's catfishing, whether it's blackmail, whether it is buying old phones or accessories that people have sold to, you know, pawn shops or um, tech places, you know, used, used tech stores, whatever. They like to go through and find it and they build these databases of people by their full names, they collect them and then they retrade them over and over again. I'll give you Jessica for Jennifer. I'll give you this person for that person. If somebody drops five pictures of this girl, I'll drop two that I have that no one's seen before. Literally, we're Pokemon cards in these circles. And so it is really important to make sure that not only you are keeping your pictures secure, but that anyone else that might have them is also keeping them secure. You know, make that a deal breaker. Oh wait, you have shitty passwords? Never mind. Like, yeah. <laughs> so if this has ever happened to somebody, and it, there's a very good chance that a good majority of this room has had pictures shared of them without their consent. Um, at last time I saw a study on it, it was up to 15%, I wanna say, of Americans had their pictures shared without their consent or had their pictures threatened to be shared. So, 
If it's happened to you, these are what we recommend that you do. Now, the first thing I want to say before any of this is breathe. I promise you it's going to be okay. You will get through this. You will survive. It is a body. It is sex. These are natural things. And somebody's trying to shame you for natural things. That's a little ridiculous. But I promise this is, you will get through this. <laughs> Next thing you want to do is screenshot, document everything, even things you don't think are going to be important. Get the header of the website, the URL. You want to get every bit of that page that you appear on. You never know what's going to be useful. You never know if you're going to see a username on there that you didn't expect to. You didn't know if you're going to see a link that maybe you didn't notice the first time. Screenshot it. Um, you want to talk to somebody about what's happening? If you're not comfortable talking to a partner or a parent or a friend, um, we have a website. I'll put it up at the end. You can always email us. No judgments. We're nice, I promise. Um, next thing you want to do is file a report with police. Even if you're not in a state that has laws, and there are still eight states out there where it's totally legal for somebody to share nudes with someone else. It doesn't matter if they're, you know, as long as the person is overage, there is no consequence whatsoever. But even if that's the case, you still want to file a report, you still want to make sure that that is on record, that's how we get laws passed. Enough people complain, people get loud, then that's how things happen. Now, once a report is filed, you want to give the police a little bit of time. Um, anyone that has ever worked with law enforcement, you know that these work Things go a lot slower than you would expect. Um, we've had cases that we've helped out on that have gone two plus years. And that's just collecting the evidence. That's before it goes to trial. We're not talking about you know court dates being pushed off. That is just to collect the evidence to get to grand jury. Um, and it, it's gonna take a while, especially if, there's an, if it's an image of an adult that tends to be a lot lower on their list. Um, one of the things that we deal with a lot is images of child abuse. So those tend to move a little bit faster, but even then, that's a couple years. Because there's a lot, you know, they have to go and find all the other victims and find out what else is out there. So, and then obviously, you know, you can contact us. We will help. This is what we do. Um, so yeah. These are, you know, just things that you can do to make sure that you're safe. Things that if this has happened to you, things you can do to fight back. Um, and one of the things I always want to talk about is um, what to do, how to be a good bystander with this sort of thing. You know, say you're hanging out with your friends and one of them says, hey, oh my gosh, look what so-and-so sent to me. I mean, that's, so many will just blow that off like it's nothing. But really what that's doing is contributing to an entire, you know, an entire behavior that is absolutely unacceptable. And one of the things that I think as a society that we need to change is really start calling each other out when we see bad behavior. It doesn't matter if it's your friend, doesn't matter if it's somebody that you care about, be like, dude, that's shitty. Do not be showing that picture to this person. Don't, that's not what you should do. Delete that. I'm going to go tell her. That's not that hard. It's what needs to happen. I think that's more of a societal issue, but that is something that we all need to think about. You know, how can we, each as individuals, do something to make the world a little bit better? Um, so, all right. It looks like we've reached the end. Um, I, uh, I'm, I, I am very happy to do any questions, answers, if anyone wants to, you know, talk or have any questions about anything. Hey, everybody. Sorry, we're going to do questions up in the middle here. Please walk up to the mic. I will be Mike. And uh, we have plenty of time for questions. So my only request is please walk up. The only reason I ask is if we start playing past the talking stick, uh, it'll turn into that beach ball at uh, high school graduation. That's fair. No worries. How do you handle working with law enforcement that's either uneducated or unwilling to help victims? 
Um, it's actually incredibly common where they're uneducated, unwilling. Um, a lot of the police haven't caught up with the internet yet at all. Um, they don't even know how to begin to handle it. They don't know how to um, even approach it. We've also had to deal with police that don't think that this is something that should be a crime. I had uh, an officer the other day that insisted that because um, the victim was married to her partner, even though they'd been separated for two years, um, that what he did was totally legal. Posted her full name on a website that was coming up in Google searches, but it is legal. And I mean, I don't know if this is the right way to go about handling those situations, but usually going and taking the time to sit down with them and explain one, what the laws are, how they can do, you know, start to approach their investigation. That helps. Um, I also yell. That helps. <laughs> I can be a little scary. It, but it's something that we come across a lot. Um, I, police don't necessarily know what the laws are in their state. They don't know that, you know, it, in Ohio, that it is illegal for people to share pictures of adults. If it's not a child, and I mean, when I say child, I mean prepubescent. We've had issues with police even investigating teenage pictures, of like big issues, where they say it's too much work. We don't, we can't prove how old they were in that picture. So this is something that we come across, and some each case is going to be different. So I have a question. I don't know if you've been aware of the developments between Cloudflare and uh, what was it, 8chan, and how they finally got banned. And I was wondering, what is? How did you feel that will trickle down to what you are doing in fighting and CP, and if you think it'll help you push for those kinds of websites that are completely just like you know First Amendment. We we refuse to do anything. And do you think that the decision by Cloudflare to finally get rid of 8chan will help? you and badass army in using that kind of technique to shut down these websites or do you think it's going to be a hindrance at like the end of you know in the long run or it's going to actually help um i think the fact that cloudflare is starting to take a stance on um where they feel as a private company the differences between free speech and harming others is i mean yes it took this long for them to do anything about 8chan, and they ignored many, many requests from a lot of people about some very serious crimes that were happening. Um, that's something we've been dealing with a while. We've been reporting child abuse images to them forever, and we were having issues with them handling that. Um, I think it is a private company's you know, responsibility to start maintaining a, um, you know, a, con a uh, code of conduct in a way. I can't think of the word right now. It's that day. Um, but to enforce their own terms of service, to make some rules, and to have some morals. Yes, there is some gray area when it comes to free speech and what that means to different people, but that's something that more companies need to take a look at and see where their line is. Because I was just wondering if you think it'll make it easier because it took them the shoot like 40 people dead for them to do anything. And you know, because I've worked battling um, CPB on the internet as well in my own time, and I know how hard it is. And I just want to know if you think that now that it's not going to take us, like our community, wait till somebody gets killed over this for them to do something. I would just want to know if you think that's going to help or if it's going to help for us not having to wait till somebody gets completely like slaughtered through this for co companies like that to just do it without given us the run around forever like they have. I fully agree. I, it's, um, I think it's ridiculous that it is taking people's lives ending in order to get something to somebody to pay attention. But um, I also think it's a, one of the reasons that that's happening is not necessarily because somebody's lives end, ended. That's not how that's, that's not what happened. What happened is people got outraged enough and it looked bad for their PR. And that's what needs to happen in order for them to do anything. If they could have kept it quiet that it was on 8chan and that they had been hosting it, if they could have just, you know, made that go away, then guess what? 
Cloudflare would still be covering them. It'd be fine. You need to be loud, you need to make noise, and get people pissed off. There's a lot of anger in this world, and it can do things. <laughs> Okay, so I don't necessarily have a question, but more of, a, of an observation. Would that be okay? Yeah. All right, so uh, this is DEF CON, and this is a massive gathering of hackers and information security professionals who has taken it upon themselves to guard the information, and it could be any information. It could be like something sim simple as like personally identifiable information. It could be state secrets with the potential to kill a small population. We have taken it upon ourselves to guard this. So when someone decides to like leak nudes of other people, I I have to I would have to ask myself, could that want, could the perpetrator of those crimes really be be trusted to carry out the duties of protecting others' information right there. And, th and like, when we, so when we look at these perpetrators and what they do, uh, we can't, we can't just simply look at it as merely a offense against one individual, but rather as a threat to an entire community right there. But that's just my two cents. No, you're very right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Really, that's, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> So, obviously, you guys deal with, you know, CP, and you, you can't tell me that you don't come across forms daily of these images being shared with some really, 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 really disgusting stuff with them. How do you and everyone else have, I guess, the mental fortitude to handle this on a day-to-day -day basis? Tequila? <laughs> um... <laughs> You know, we try to do a lot of self-care. Uh, another one under the, uh, under the deck there. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, we, you know, we are a team, and I am so grateful for the fact that I do have a great team. They're right over here, guys. Um, everybody wave. Stand up. We all know each other. Um, and there's more of us. There, you know, we're global. We have a constant, sometimes infuriating group chat that is just going on 24 seven. Um, and we call each other out on things. We talk to each other. Hey, you're not, you don't, you're not doing okay. Why don't you go take a nap? Why don't you go take a night off? And we have to do that. Um, I am comfortable enough to say I see a therapist. You have to. Um, I've gone and I've helped out with CP cases where I've had to go and uh, help with the evidence when they collected the laptops and things like that and go through and help the police decide, okay, well, can we contact this victim? Can we contact that victim? And help them build a case. And gosh, there were a few days where I went through thousands and thousands of images of child stuff, just nonstop for eight hours. And that's what you have to do. And you don't forget that. And it does take a mental toll on you. And, but I know that in the end, it's going to be for the best. Mostly that's what really pushes it and keeps the mental fortitude going is, you know, I, yes, this sucks for me, but I get to go make a change. So that's important. <laughs> Hi. Um, so thank you for the talk. I unfortunately missed like some parts of it. Uh, I got lost. Anyway, um, so my question is like, what, a, uh, you mentioned that the team is global and, uh, I was wondering like, w what's the status right now about working with other countries? Like, especially those countries that, um, these kinds of things are shameful and just swept under the rug with people like dealing with these things throughout their lives and they're, they're like so ashamed to like even talk about it? Um, well, we, it's become global just because more people have found out about us and reached out. There are certain parts of the world that that's not an option. There's no way that they're finding out about us. One, you know, either it's because they don't have access to a, our website or any of our press, things like that. We have tried to reach out as much as we can and as far as the other countries where it is really shameful, actually Marley the other day, she said something that really hit home with me. And that is that we get to decide where our private, where our private parts are. 
Like you get to this, for some people, it's their shoulders. They don't want their shoulders on the internet. For some people, it's their breasts. You know, it's their whole body. Everybody has their limit. And what to them is private might not be the same for someone else. And so we've been dealing with a lot of countries where that cultural difference is very big, where an ankle is considered racier than, you know, what a pair of boobs here in America. So in those countries, we are mostly just trying to catch up and learn those cultural differences and reach out to victims and find out what these consequences are and see where the, you know, interest lies as far as making sure that we can get some laws in place. I know there's a huge issue. Um, over in uh, South Korea, they had uh, spy cams in bathrooms that were going on. It was thousands and thousands of pictures of women going to the bathroom were being uploaded. Um, and the women, ro you know, they rose up and said, we're not going to do this anymore. And it was like the badass army, but just out of everyone was just angry. It was actually really cool how they went and rose up like that. But down in South America, there's nothing getting done at all. We've been trying. Um, there are no laws even in talks of happening. But I think that's something we're going to be working toward here very soon. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about like what the civil law landscape looks like for this, like in places where maybe you can't actually like criminally like prosecutes the perpetrator? Have there been successes in like suing the shit out of them for emotional distress? Yes, there have been. Um, we always want to recommend if you don't have the option for a criminal suit to work on a civil suit. We have a lot of lawyers that we connect with that'll work either pro bono or, um, you know, at least at a discounted rate or um, just for, you know, a portion of the win of the money one. So, we recommend people do that. There have been a lot of successful cases. There was just one, I want to say it was a little over a year ago in California that was $10 million. So there's money. And sometimes a, with some people, the criminal um, repercussions are not going to be as big as when you hit them in the wallet. So that we always recommend people do that. Um, at the very least, getting a lawyer, having them being able to write a letter is enough to scare someone into removing the pictures that they've put up. So it, it there's been a lot of wins, a lot. Um, and most of the time they settle because you know, it's really ironic. These guys that share these pictures, they really don't like people to find out they share them. They don't like being exposed. I mean, who would have thought, but they're, yeah, they usually will settle to keep it quiet and settlements are usually around five figures. We have, we have a couple more. All right, line on up, people. I know standing can be a drag, so please. We're still good for time, if that's okay with the speaker. Yeah. Okay. So I just wonder, what is your turnaround time for if uh, images are posted and you guys start sending letters, uh, what's your turnaround time for getting, getting those images removed? And all, the, the follow-up also is, once an image goes to a, a famous site, how hard is it to then track everywhere else that's picked it up? Um. Well, the, fir the first question about uh, what our turnaround time is, it all depends on the website. We have websites that we work with that will get it down pretty much instantly, like within an hour or two of us sending the letter. Um, there are some that will take a week. It depends on what site, whether or not you know they've talked to us, how serious they are about making sure this isn't being shared on their sites, and um, you know how responsive they are to DMCAs. Um, and then the second one was, uh, how do we make sure it's not anywhere else? You know, Google image search is a wonderful thing. A lot of people don't know how to use it. I didn't when it first happened to me. Um, and, but, you know, that does help a lot. Also, knowing where to look. You know, once, you know, people talk to us, we usually recommend, hey, you might want to check this site. Here's this search engine that's going to go through 4chan. Look for things that are going to, you know, if it's out there anywhere else. So... It's kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes you find it, sometimes you don't. But we do our best to make sure we can. So you were mentioning that uh, the, uh, the sites would be like reliant to take action. And so when you catch a guy sharing something that is like non-consensual, is the guy the only one that is held accountable for? 
or for example, does the page also has the responsibility for that? And also another question is when you mentioned the case that the guy didn't share the pictures per se, but he got hacked, is he also held accountable for it or only like the first person? Um, well, let's start with the first question as to whether or not websites are being held accountable. Um, and that's actually a hot topic right now. Um, there is something in the, um, the CDA, it's a law that basically says that websites are not being held accountable for what the users do with it. And a lot of sites have been hiding behind that. Basically, if someone shares a picture of you that you don't like or slanders you on Facebook, you can't go sue Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but more and more, it's a, a statute called CDA 230, and more and more people are fighting against that and making some you know, changes. Um, there's a lawyer out in New York named Carrie Goldberg who has been raging against CDA 230, and we're she's you know setting precedents to possibly have it removed. Um, I'm not saying that the website should always be held accountable, like Facebook. I don't think you should be able to sue Mark Zuckerberg because someone slandered you, but I think that having some consequences for the websites knowingly hosting illegal content is something that should happen. They, there needs to be some sort of consequences there, deterrent. And the second question was, um, now in my case, where you know the, my ex-boyfriend had his cell phone stolen, um, or if a guy is hacked, um, depending on the investigation, honestly, because we've had police that they're just gonna go for the first person they find that they can arrest for this crime. They're not gonna follow through, they're not gonna find out if that person was really hacked, they're just going to say, well, we know it came from them. And we've run into that. It, it really, there is no set way that these things go. Um, I don't think that somebody, I think it all depends on each different individual case, really. Hi. I've got more of a comment than a question. But first of all, I want to thank you for everything that you and your team are doing <clears throat> around this. You know, there's a lot of bad things on the internet. And I, I think it shows a lot of uh, you know, great character and fortitude for you and your team to take these horrendous things that happened to you and turn it into something positive. I've got two teenage daughters and I have a you know, talk to, you, to them about the website and the work you're doing and you know, it's, it's unfortunate that I have to have these conversations with them, but better to have them informed and empowered than ignorant. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> keep doing, keep, keep talking to your daughters. Keeping that communication open and talking to them about these difficult things is the best thing you can do to make sure this doesn't happen to them at any point in their life. Really. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, back with another question. Um, has SESTA-FOSTA impacted any, any of this? Um, all right, well, that's gonna, I'm gonna answer that in two ways. Uh, actually, right behind you, you've got like the SESTA-FOSTA expert that's out talk right there. And we are doing a meetup a little bit later over in the Sin City room, and we're going to be covering a lot of that. But when it comes to SESA FOSTA, really what it's been coming down to is it should be getting used for what we do. But the issue is everybody's going after the low-hanging fruit of sex workers. Um, rather than it being used to really, you know, help people that are being exploited, they're using it to um, shut down consensual sex workers and I think that's really wrong. It's not being used the way it should. It needs to be um, remedied, that's for sure. Hi. Hi. Amazing job. Um, so I thought uh, one of the questions that I had that I thought would be really great maybe for people in this room to be more aware of is as someone who also works like in sex technology, um, what have been some of the double standards that you've faced uh, of just, you know, being professionally invalidated with the work that you do in terms of using sex tech and using OSINT and kind of solidifying yourself as like this security professional and for everything that you've accomplished and like, I don't know, maybe if you could just share some of those double standards with us so we can see like how can we can all be more aware and be more supportive of the victims that you help and also your entire team. Oh, um, well, some of, a lot of the double standards that we've encountered have been, obviously, you know, there's a little bit of the gender 
double standards, that is a really common thing that I know that we all know is an issue in this industry. Um, and that's something that we, I think a lot of people are working on and hopefully going, you know, changing. I hear that this is the most gender equal DEF CON as far as attendance that has happened yet. So that's, I mean, we're, get, we're working on the, just that part. Um, now, when it comes to what you were saying about, you know, not just a double standard, but like some of the things that we've heard based on being, you know, people that are pro, we're sex positive. We support sex workers. We want to help make sure that they are not having their pictures spread all over with their real names. Um, and we do experience a lot of flack from that. Uh, I get a lot of hate mail. I, I, I think a lot of it's really, in a way, they don't even, these guys don't even realize that they're, you know, complimenting me. I was called, uh, oh gosh, what was it? The, I, somebody said I was like the, the white knight of, of sluts and whores. What? Oh yeah, we have that. I have a trophy for that one. I had that, my friends had that made. Um, but yeah, we get, um, people that get really angry and they say that, you know, you're promoting, you're promoting promiscuity. You're promoting, um, women being slutty. Cause heaven forbid anyone promote women enjoying sex. It's a little, it's ridiculous, but it's something that we do see quite a bit. Um, but I also want to mention when I talk about double standards and things like that, that it's not just women. I use gen a lot of gender language when I talk about this, but it happens to men extremely frequently. Um, there's a lot of blackmailing scams out there with the cam girls and suddenly they've got a picture of you, um, you know, having fun with the cam girl. I think that's how they word it in the emails they use, but it, it, it's just as traumatic for men. It's a extra danger to the LGBT, you know, that whole community of being outed without their permission. It is, um, it's not just women. It, it's a majority women, but it's not, that's for sure. Sorry, I meant to mention that earlier, but the whole double standard thing had me, wanted, it reminded me. Um, but yeah, no, we definitely do see a double standard when it comes to uh, promoting sex, not promoting sex work, but helping support sex workers and fighting for them. We see that a lot, so. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.